Hello and welcome to this introduction to Blender. My name is Kevin Crompwell and I'm the guest lecturer for the 3D section of Digital Media Studies 103 at the University of Rochester. So today we'll be exploring Blender, which is our 3D program of choice. What you're seeing on screen right now is more or less exactly how Blender should look the first time you launch it up. In the center of our page, you'll notice that we have a splash screen. And what this does is it tells us the current version of Blender that we're using, along with the date that that version was released at, and we have a couple of columns of information that will become useful. So in this instance, we're using Blender version 2.79, in the lab, we're using version 2.78. Don't worry about the discrepancy between these two versions. They're virtually identical for what it is we're trying to achieve. So back to these two columns, we have some links that lead to some useful information. We have Blender's manual, their website, some API references for the Python scripting language, as well as release logs, etc. On the right column, we have recent projects that I've been working on. So if you've been working on something and saved it recently, Blender will most likely remember that for you and you'll be able to quickly access it here. If for any reason you had a terminated session within Blender and you'd like to recover the information from that, you can try using this button here and Blender will do its best to retrieve that information for you. This is not foolproof, however, so just be aware of that. Lastly, we have an interaction selection here. If you're from a 3D Studio Max or Maya workflow, you're more than welcome to try these two presets out, and I believe Blender will do its best to try to emulate those two workflows. However, for the scope of this tutorial, we're going to be sticking with the default Blender interaction mode. Now to close the splash screen, all we have to do is click anywhere that isn't one of these buttons, and it'll disappear. If for any reason we need to access that again, simply come up to the Help menu and find Splash Screen, and it'll open itself up. All right, now that we've covered the splash screen, let's take a look at Blender's user interface. We're going to go through this relatively quickly, so feel free to slow down the video or rewind it as many times as you need. Essentially, what we're looking at seems pretty busy and complicated, but in reality, there are only a handful of panels that we need to worry about. So let's take a look at each of those one at a time. Starting with the green area I've highlighted at the top, we have our info panel. The reason we can tell that this is the info panel is if we hover over this little icon, we can see that it tells us the current editor type for this area is the info panel, and we can see that this dropdown will allow us to change this to any other type of panel that we'd like. Now the info panel has the file option. We can create new files, save them, check our user preferences, load our factory settings, and quit the application. We have a basic render rollout, which we're not actually going to be using. We have a window rollout and a help rollout. These are all pretty standard. The help menu might be useful because you can check Blender's manual, you can report bugs, and you can check the splash screen if you need it. The next setting we have is the ability to change Blender's layout. So there are some preset layouts that you can use for different things. We're just going to be sticking with the default. If at some point down the line, you decide to configure the panels in a way that's most useful for you, you can actually add it, give it a special name, it'll be found in this list. And then if at a later point you decide you don't like it, you can also delete it. Same thing with the scene editor. If you don't wanna save separate um, Blender files and you want to have multiple scenes within this file, you can actually create an additional scene and switch back and forth between them without needing to close Blender. And then of course, if you don't like a scene, you can delete it. Just make sure that you've saved your file so that you don't lose that information if you wanna access it later. The next option we have is the ability to change Blender's render engine. By default, it comes as Blender Render. We're going to switch to Cycles Render. For those of you with a keen eye, you'll notice that this panel has changed over here because we switched over to a different renderer. Don't worry, we'll discuss those settings later. The next set of information is basically a useful summary of everything that's going on in our 3D scene, which is this big window here and it tells us the components that our scene is comprised of. It'll tell us how many objects are there, how many lamps, the amount of memory that it's taking up, and the current object that is selected, being this cube. If I select something else, you'll see that that is actually changing, and we can still tell that we have one of three objects selected. So this is a nice little summary. We'll be referencing that at a later point. The next window that we need to take a look at is the outliner panel. Essentially what this is, if I unhighlight it really quickly, is it's a short breakdown of everything that's in our scene. It's basically just a simple list and we can see the active things, orphan data, user preferences, as well as things that are only in the current scene or only visible. However, by default, it's set to all scenes. Now one really interesting and useful um, 
thing about this panel is that you can actually toggle some of these options here and this eye icon in the first column allows you to hide things from the viewport as we just saw there. The uh, pointer icon allows you to protect objects from being clicked and edited in case you want to lock down these objects so that they don't get moved or edited in any way. And the camera icon will allow us to turn off these objects at render time so that they aren't considered when Blender goes to render your image. So that's the outliner panel. The next panel we have is here, the properties panel. The properties panel is a very hefty panel. There's a ton of information in here. Basically, there are detailed sets of information about everything happening in your 3D scene. There's a bunch of tools in there that you can use for various things. And if you pay attention to this, as I right click on our cube, it actually changes contextually based on what you have selected. It gives us a couple of options for editing this cube and editing various parts of our 3D scene. So if you're looking for very detailed information about scene manipulation, you'll probably want to look in the properties menu. The next menu that we want to look at is the timeline at the very bottom. Now this is where we would create keyframes and store animation data as well as watch back information that we've created for animations. However, we are not going to be dealing with that for this section of the course. So we're going to end up deleting that area or hiding it later on because it's only taking up space. The last section that we have here is our 3D viewer, which is the largest portion of the screen. And that's where all the magic's going to happen when we manipulate our objects and do everything in 3D. And really, that's all that there is to it. It's a pretty simple breakdown of just a handful of different panels. Of course, there are a lot of options within each of those panels, but that's all we really need to know in order to understand the basics of the Blender user interface. So now that we have a basic understanding of the panel layout of Blender's user interface, let's take a look at manipulating it. So to do that, we need to understand exactly the way that Blender has been laid out by default. So at the top, we have our info panel, which kind of stretches across the entire application in its own row. And then we have two columns of panels. So there are really only five panels. And the two columns that we have are the 3D view panel along with the timeline panel in the left column and the outline panel and the properties panel in the right column. So if we find this dividing line that dissects the entire application plane here, we can actually grab that when our, eye, when our cursor turns into a double arrow icon, and we can actually drag and squish the left column and vice versa. So that can be very useful for resizing and rearranging our screen. And then if we pay attention to each of these panels, we'll notice that there are these little handles that exist in the lower left and upper right corner, and they exist on every existing panel. What these allow us to do is if we'd like to create additional windows, so for example, if we wanted a third row inside the second column, or the first column, we can actually click and drag up on that. And then if we wanted to collapse and get rid of that, simply click and drag over until you see this little arrow that appears. And once you let go, it'll actually collapse that. So in this case, we want to collapse down on the timeline since we're not going to be using that. You'll see your little arrow overlay appears, let go, and it will get rid of that. Now, for example, if we tried to come across the columns by expanding our 3D view, we can't actually do that because we have two panels in this column and only one here. In order to do that, we would need to collapse this top one over this bottom one or the bottom over the top, and then we could collapse one over the other. So you have to be a little careful about which option is adjacent and which option needs to be lined up properly. Now, if any, at any point you get Blender's layout all out of whack and you don't know what you're looking at, you can simply come up to the file menu and load the factory settings. It'll ask you if you're okay with that. You can confirm it by clicking again and Blender will return to your factory settings. Just keep in mind that when you do this, what will happen is all of your settings will be reverted. Anything that you change in the user preferences, the render engine itself will also change. Everything will return back to the way Blender shipped. So let's start by getting rid of our timeline again, and now we should be ready to delve into some user preferences options in the next portion of our video. So now that we have a command of manipulating Blender's user interface, let's take a look at some user preferences that will help us better set up Blender to do what we want it to do. In order to achieve this, let's go up to the file menu here and look for user preferences. This will open a small pop-up box 
this happened off screen for me because I'm using a two display setup. But if you're using a one display setup, it should just pop open right here for you. The first thing I'm going to do is come over to our add-ons tab and I'm going to turn on this specific add-on. Don't worry about this. This is just something I'm doing for your benefit in this tutorial. Unfortunately, I don't have access to this add-on inside of the lab as it's something that needs to be installed manually. However, you should find that it is pretty useful for this tutorial. Now that it's on, you'll see there's this little display that shows you what I'm clicking on the mouse and what keyboard shortcuts I'm pressing. So back in our user preferences, the first thing that we should address is in the input tab. On this left column, we can actually change the way Blender interprets the buttons that we press and the things that we click in order to get it to do what we want it to do. By default, Blender is a little strange. It actually forces us to select objects using a right click, which you can see represented in this little diagram. The reason why it does this, however, is because if you're working with a laptop that doesn't have a three button mouse, say you're using a trackpad or something else, or maybe just a two button mouse, uh, you won't be able to navigate the workspace. So there is actually the opportunity for you to emulate a three button mouse using this option here. But if we hover over and read the tooltip, it actually says emulate middle mouse with alt left mouse click. Doesn't work with left mouse selection option. So it's a little unfortunate that if we do need to emulate a three button mouse, we can't actually switch to being able to select objects with a left click. The reason for this is if we use the left click selection and we try to orbit around our scene using alt left mouse click, which is what the middle mouse button does. I'll show you that in a minute. What will happen is Blender won't be able to tell if you're trying to select the object or move around it, and therefore it gets confused. And so to avoid that, it forces us to use the right click in order to select objects. So just keep that in mind if you're working with a laptop or a home computer and you don't have access to a three button mouse, feel free to emulate one and just get used to right clicking in order to select objects. The reason we want to use a left click to select our objects is because in almost every industry standard creative software, we're going to be using the left click to select things that we want to manipulate. Now, another option that we need to keep in mind is that if you have a keyboard that doesn't have the extended number pad, most likely if you're working on a laptop or if you have one of the newer Apple keyboards that no longer includes the number pad, you might need to emulate the number pad. And you can do that using this option here. Essentially what this does is it takes all the hot keys that are normally delegated to your number pad and maps them to the one through zero keys at the top of any standard keyboard. So keep that in mind. But because in this setup and in the lab, we have a three button mouse and a keyboard with an extended number pad. We're simply going to keep our options the same and I'm going to change our select with to left. Now, any changes that we make within the user preferences need to be saved, so make sure you click this button. The only issue with this is that when you're in the lab, you'll have some problems because the computers reset overnight, so it's more than likely that when you log in, you're going to have to change the select with to left each time. A little unfortunate, but that's the price we pay for having to use lab computers, I suppose. So the last thing I wanna show you in the user preferences layout is that there's a theme tab. If you don't like the way Blender looks, if you think it's too bland or too gray, you have a number of theme presets that you can change between and find one that actually picks your fancy, I suppose. I, however, will be working with the default theme and you can reset to that using this button here. Personally, I prefer the R theme, so feel free to check those out. Uh, but like I said, I'll be using the default theme just so that we can stay on the same page. The last thing I'm going to do is simply for my setup, you don't have to worry about this in the lab because we don't have this option. But if you have a CUDA enabled GPU at home, if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. But if you do happen to have an NVIDIA GPU, feel free to enable CUDA. That'll just make rendering a little faster and a little easier to deal with. And that's all we need to worry about for our user preferences.